Hey, hey, Business 150, Introduction to Management. Welcome back. We are still in Module 8, but now we're on video number 3 in our series uh, examining the topic of organization. And as you can see from this title slide, in this video, we're looking at the topic of job design. We mentioned job design in the last previous video about how organizing works. And we talked about the first step being job design. And in this video, we're going to take a closer look at that very important topic. We hope that at the end of this video, you will be able to explain why job specialization and division of labor are important for organizing and assess the different approaches to grouping tasks into jobs and the advantages and disadvantages of each of those approaches. All righty. So consider job specialization. What do we mean by that term, job specialization? What we mean is the division of labor into smaller distinct tasks. The division of labor results from assigning these distinct tasks to different workers. As a result of assigning these tasks to different workers, what we end up having is the opportunity for the individual worker to get better and better and really mature their expertise at a small number of tasks. As a result, since they don't have to do everything, but they can turn their attention to getting better and better, faster and more efficient at a smaller number of tasks, they are able to specialize their skills. Job design then is the process of grouping these tasks into jobs and defining job roles distinctly across different workers. And quite frankly, there are two major schools of job design, the classical job design school and the behavioral job design school. So let's see if we can compare these two. The first perspective is the classical job design method. And this is uh, the classical approach to job design. It's based on the principles of division of labor and specialization. And this actually goes all the way back to the fine book of 1776. Yep, 1776, all the way back then. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And in that book, all the way back in 1776, Smith argues that a way to increase productivity in any market system is to put in place the division of labor and job specialization. And as a result, when you allow workers to not have to complete all the steps of a process, but only to have to work on a small number or perhaps just one of those steps on a daily basis, you get certain advantages. And so you see there, when jobs are divided, second bullet point, they are reduced in complexity and operations until the activities of a single worker can be repeated with ease. What are the advantages of specialization? Well, the advantages you can see there, workers are assigned to only one small part of the entire work process, and therefore they become very knowledgeable about that small part and about they can do that part very, very quickly. In addition, in more mechanized environments like production assembly lines, when you separate, separate, separate the many parts of a, an entire assembly process into individual parts, you can develop very specialized tools and equipment to handle each one of those steps with a great level of focus and emphasis. They don't have to do everything, just the one step over and over and over and over again. And as a result, the net result is more product can be made more quickly with far less cost. And you would be astounded to see just how much the exponential growth in throughput and production is by using what we today look at as the assembly line, the distinct division of a very large complex process into individual steps and then having workers specialize in a very small number or perhaps only one small part of the work process. This is why we have affordable automobiles. This is why we have widespread affordable electronic devices. It's because of the classical job design approach, separating large complex manufacturing tasks into very small number of parts. But there are disadvantages and you see it illustrated here with these very frustrated, bored, mindless workers just leaning their heads up against the cubicle out of frustration. The disadvantages of specialization, well, think about it. 
if you are performing the exact same task over and over and over and over again, eight hours on Monday, eight hours on Tuesday, eight hours on Wednesday, eight hours on Thursday, eight hours on Friday, it becomes boring. It becomes monotonous. It becomes mindless. And that that's what affects quality. Workers end up fighting monotony all day. And they end up fighting it in some ways by just being absent or calling in sick when they're not really sick or showing up late and leaving early and being tardy and not being engaged, not being passionate, not really focusing, not just phoning it in, just showing it up for the money, right? And those kinds of jobs over and over again, the same repetitive movements, well, you know what happens? It results in all sorts of fatigue injuries like carpal tunnel syndrome and all sorts of things, right? Specialization allows managers to replace workers fairly quickly and relatively inexpensively, and that leads to job insecurity. If all I have to do is move this part from this shelf to this machine, that's all I do, they could probably hire a trained monkey to do it, and maybe they will, or replace me with a robot. What kind of job security do I have if I could be easily replaced by a robot? Well, I want to tell you, this is a very serious problem. You know, this really raised its ugly head in the late 70s when there was great pressure on the American automobile industry to improve quality and performance. And what you had was, of course, a lot of auto workers who were doing very routine, monotonous, over and over again kinds of assembly, man, assembly line jobs. And this led to what we sometimes saw as the sabotage of the Chevy Cavalier. What does that mean? Well... One of the things that was reported in the news during this period was frustrated auto workers sabotaging their own product. What did that look like? Well, it, what one very, very famous example is the Chevy Cavalier. Chevy Cavalier was a widely sold model by Chevrolet back in the 70s. And some Chevrolet buyers were finding that when the car got up to around 65, 70 miles an hour on the freeway, they started hearing this rattling noise inside the door of the car. What's going on here? They would take it back to the dealership. The dealer couldn't figure it out. They didn't see anything loose. And then finally, someone in the service department, by happenstance, took off the inner panel to see what was going on inside the door where you couldn't see. You know what that person found? An empty Coca-Cola bottle inside the door who on earth would have put that there well there's really only one person who could have put that coke bottle there yes you're right it's an assembly line worker in detroit so bored with his job so demoralized he ended up drinking a bottle of coke and just sticking the empty bottle into the door and then sealing it up with the inner panel shoving the car down to the next station the assembly line yes a worker who is so disengaged disenfranchised, demoralized, he's willing to sabotage his own product. That's what you end up with, one of the disadvantages of classical job design. As a result, there emerges another approach to job design. We call it, as you see on the slide, the behavioral approach to job design a method that realizes that workers are independent parts of the production process and that they as individuals and their characteristics should be taken into account in forming jobs. And what does this mean? Trying to bring growth and satisfaction instead of boredom and monotony. And there are different ways that we introduce methods and approaches, behavioral approaches into job design. You see three of them uh, called out there job enlargement, job rotation, and job enrichment. What is job enlargement? Well, it focuses on increasing the number of tasks that comprise a job. It helps people to fight boredom and monotony by giving them more than just one simple task or two simple tasks. You give them a few more and you get a little variety in the job and that can help to mitigate boredom and monotony. The second is job rotation, you see that illustrated there, involves a deliberate plan to move workers to various different jobs on a scheduled basis. And so maybe this next two weeks you're working at this station, but then 
after the end of the two weeks, you're moved to the next station. It means that you have a far more variety and a different focus, and that breaks things up for you to try and fight the boredom. And then job enrichment, you see there, focuses on increasing the number of similar tasks involved, especially tasks that require some little bit of information processing. Maybe you actually got to make some decisions, and therefore the fact that you are responsible for decisions made in the process you means that you're more intellectually and therefore more emotionally involved in the process. That's what's hoped for from each of these different approaches to expanding the job in a sense to be able to provide some more growth and job satisfaction. Some examples from the textbook you see there, figure 8.2 in the text, examples of the behavioral approach to job design. An example of job, of job enlargement might be an IT manager who also becomes responsible for information security. And so you are giving more tasks there, right? An example of job rotation, a civil engineering intern switches her job duties every three months. And so that way she begins to broaden her experience, but also gives her a relief from doing the same thing over and over and over again every single day. An example of job enrichment, you see it there. A product development team is given additional decision-making authority over the design. It's maybe an area that other product development teams in the past weren't given. But now since they have decision-making authority, they are responsible and they feel invested in making the right decision. Well, those are examples of the behavioral approach to sort of, sort of balance out and counteract some of the disadvantages of the classical way of looking at job design. We hope this is helpful. We hope this helps you to explain why job specialization and division of labor are important when we talk about organizing. In fact, it's the foundational bedrock of organization and to assess the different approaches, this classical approach to job design, the behavioral approach to job design, and the advantages and disadvantages of each. So hope this is helpful. We'll keep looking at this very important topic of organiz organization and organizing in our next video. See you there.